Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Charlie Baker. I'm the executive director of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. And uh, we've undertaken this I-89 2050 study that we'll be talking about tonight. And Dave, I guess let's go to the next slide. And yeah, so uh, this obviously is a virtual meeting. Um, so you're coming in, you're muted by default. Uh, if you'd like to speak, uh, please click or tap the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and we'll call on you then. Um, I don't see anyone connect by phone, but you can raise your hand by star nine if you are. Um, and after you've been called on, uh, click or tap the unmute button. So you still need to do that. And there's also another option if you don't wanna speak verbally to the uh, group, uh, you can write a question in the Q&A button at the bottom of your, of your screen. Thank you. So uh, here's an outline of the presentation that we're walking through tonight. Uh, first, welcome. We're at that stage now. Um, and then uh, I'll kind of give an overview of the whole project and the, the process that we've gone through over the last couple of years. And then David Saladino will pick it up uh, from the VHB team and review the corridor bundles and the implementation plan. And then I'll uh, grab the mic back and we'll uh, take uh, questions and discussion at the end and talk about next steps. Um, but if you do have questions during the presentation um, and you know we can answer it uh, pretty quickly, we'll do that. If it's a longer conversation, I may ask to come back to that question at the end so we can have a fuller discussion uh, just to make sure we can get through this. Um, it probably, um, if no interruptions, it might be 30-ish minutes with some discussions, you know, maybe 40 minutes or longer. So uh, just in case you're planning your time. Um, and here's the project overview. So um, I'm not going to read all of this, uh, but this is uh, kind of the, the statement that we started with, uh, collaborating with VTRANS, the municipalities and other stakeholders to develop an investment program for 80, the 89 corridor for the next 30 years. Uh, we do have a vision, goals, and objective statement, uh, and really trying to identify and prioritize enhancements for the 89 corridor over that time frame. And just a visual, uh, you can see the whole map of Chittenden County on the left. And uh, then we zoomed in because um, the real issues that we're trying to uh, really address happen in the core of Chittenden County. Uh, particularly around the exit 14 interchange. So uh, there you see a zoom in box there. And so uh, this is kind of the beginning of the statement. We've had an advisory committee that has worked with us through this whole process. Um, and uh, these are uh, statements that they developed over the course of a few meetings early on. Um, and of course, you know, pretty early on with this, we went into COVID, right? Um, and so this first statement is just about uncertainty uh, with related to COVID, uh, but then also other things are going to change over the next 30 years, technology, demographics, and, and probably other things that we don't even know about right now. Um, and so we just wanna, the statement is to recognize that we're gonna have to reassess things periodically uh, to make sure that we're addressing the evolving situation as best we can. Um, the vision statement uh, talks about the 89 being the interstate system, mainline and interchanges that is safe, resilient, and provides for reliable and efficient movement of people and goods in support of state, regional, regional and municipal plans and goals. And again, we recognize that uh, these vision goals and objectives and implementation actions that follow will need to be monitored and reassessed periodic periodically to ensure they address the evolving situation. So um, again, kind of reinforcing uh, things, are, things will change. And uh, then the group came up with six uh, goal statements, uh, one addressing safety, one addressing livable and sustainable and healthy communities, uh, one mobility and efficiency, one environmental stewardship and resilience, uh, economic access and vitality, and then system preservation. Um, and these are very similar to our long range goals as the Regional Planning Commission for the region. Okay, and then uh, to kind of uh, review where we are in the process, um, you'll see on this graphic, and I know you can't read all the words under these green boxes, uh, so I'll try to give a quick summary here. Um, 
we started in the summer of 19, kicking off the meeting. That was task one. The consultant team dug in and uh, looked at current conditions um, and what we call the future base scenario. Uh, we had some focus group meetings at that time um, and started you know, tweaking our travel demand model uh, to be as accurate as possible. Then task three, and this is where we had those meetings to develop the vision and goal statements that I just reviewed. And task four, um, and this was a little bit of, um, we took some time just because the interchanges are such a major component of the system um, to really dig into evaluating interchange possible improvements. Um, we went through a couple rounds of interchange evaluation. We also looked at possible secondary land use growth. Um, and that's kind of the idea of induced demand. If you add capacity or connections into or interchanges into the system, you may uh, induce some level of land development in that area. And so we spent some time looking at that um, and spent quite a bit of time at this stage, uh, particularly with South Burlington, uh, because uh, the interchanges that we were focused on, exit 14, 13, and a potential 12B are all within South Burlington city limits. And so I uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, early last, I think that was early in 21, particularly um, with many meetings with the city um, to come up, to narrow down. And that wasn't making a final decision, but we were trying to narrow the number of interchanges we were looking at. And then um, task five, um, and here we started to get a little broader uh, in terms of looking at corridor improvement bundles. Um, and this was also particularly in response to uh, feedback we got, but also um, just in response to the situation we're in with regard to climate change, uh, the legislature's Global Warming Solutions Act, we uh, spent a lot more time on transportation demand management and had a focus group that really guided that work um, brought on another consultant, uh, RSG, to uh, develop a strategic model to evaluate transportation demand options. And, and those options are really things to reduce the demand for driving on the highway network, um, which means things like buses, uh, uh, bikes, pedestrians working from home, all the things that uh, avoid driving. And then uh, moving on to the implementation plan, uh, which is kind of where we are tonight. Um, we uh, looked at which things are recommended and then how do we monitor those? What are we measuring? What might be a trigger for moving something forward? Um, and that's really the focus of tonight is to really look at um, what has come out of all of this work and the implementation plan and how we're going to monitor and trigger um, and looking for any feedback you have on that. Uh, and then following this um, over the summer months, um, this is really a documentation step. Uh, so the consultant team and the project team at, at the RPC and VTrans will make sure we have everything documented uh, so that we're prepared for next steps down the road. And with that, I will turn it over to David. Thank you. No questions for me. That was good. I got through the easy part. Right. Good, good job. Okay. So now we'll get into a little bit more of the details of um, what has happened in the kind of the last uh, over the last few months as we get towards uh, some recommendations for the corridor. <clears throat> and um, so Charlie mentioned this term, the, these corridor bundles. And so just to um, dig into that a little bit, what what uh, what are bundles? What went into the bundles? Um, Going to kind of highlight or simplify the process in three steps here. Uh, first, what we did uh, was to do kind of a, a full corridor assessment, and, and um, we broke this into two components. Uh, as Charlie alluded to, there was one component that was uh, focused on interchanges, and so we were looking at uh, each of the interchanges within Chittenden County uh, to evaluate their operations, how they um, could potentially um, you know, help to address some of the issues within the region. Uh, so that was the interchange evaluation. And then secondarily, we also looked at a full kind of uh, comprehensive corridor evaluation. So looking at uh, opportunities to improve safety, uh, you know, technology along the corridor, uh, transit service, um, uh, high occupancy vehicle lanes, th those types of things. So we kind of combined both the interchange, kind of the nodes at the interchanges, looking at that evaluation, and then the, 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 the corridor itself. Um, and so the, all of that kind of uh, um, once the evaluation was complete and we had gone through uh, kind of a full review with our internal committees and then also with the public, 
out of that process came these bundles uh, where we pulled um, certain interchange improvements or certain corridor improvements and put together those bundles to evaluate. And um, so as we went through that bundle evaluation process, we landed at on uh, five specific bundles. And so those are shown at the right, uh, on the right here, um, lots of acronyms, which uh, subsequent slides will, will explain kind of what all of those mean, but um, we have kind of five bundles and of note, they kind of build in, um, as you go from one through five, they get more and more pieces added to it. So number one is kind of the most basic bundle and then number five, four and five are the kind of have the most components. We'll talk about that in a few slides, but that's that's kind of where we landed with the bundles. And then where we are where we are now is kind of taking those bundles and say, how do we move those into uh, move forward towards implementation with those projects and, and recommendations. And so that uh, is the implementation plan that will guide uh, this over the next 20 or 30 years, the investments uh, along the corridor. So um, just to walk through a couple uh, some details on the, the five bundles, uh, the first one is uh, is uh, is a 2050 base. So just a reminder, we're looking out, you know, 20, uh, uh, 28 years, so uh, to, to 2050. And so bundle one is basically just um, the, our baseline uh, assessment. So bundle, uh, that bundle. And so what that, that includes, uh, so it's essentially the roadway network as it exists today, plus all of the improvements that are included in um, this three-year transportation improvement program. So those are projects that are funded uh, within the CCRPCs and VTrans's TIP for the next three years plus all of the investments identified in um, the CCRPC's ECOS plan. So their long range metropolitan, the MTP, Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Um, those are also included. And that's what's shown on the, in the map on the right. And so when you add those on top of the existing network, um, in addition to the MTP also includes um, uh, some assumptions about growth in the future. So the assumption is that 90% of, of new residential growth within Chittenden County happens uh, in existing centers. So not necessarily sprawling into the, uh, into the rural areas, but 90% of that is focused in existing centers. Uh, the MTP does call for sig significant bicycle and pedestrian uh, and transit in investments, uh, increased participation in transportation demand management programs. Uh, and then in, uh, electrification of 90% of the fleet. So all of that is baked into uh, this the, uh, bundle one. So then building from there, so we go uh, bundle one, so bundle two, well, I guess I should note one of the, the impetus for this study was really looking at the, tr at the roadway network, looking out at 2050 with these components in place. Um, what uh, during the MTP process, what what came out of that evaluation was that there were certain segments of the interstate that were uh, over capacity in 2050. And so um, this study was really the, the impetus for this study was really to evaluate uh, the I-89 corridor to identify uh, ways to address the potential for segments of I-89 to, to go over capacity over the next 30 years. And so what we see with this 2050 base is that these what the improvements that are shown on the screen were not sufficient to kind of bend the curve, the growth in, tra in travel uh, enough to avoid having to add lanes on the interstate. So doing nothing is not necessarily a, uh, a long-term solution. And so from there, we build uh, some bundles on top. And, and the first, as Charlie alluded to, uh, is um, the idea here is really focusing on non-capacity uh, non expansion projects. And so these are um, uh, transportation demand management measures that are identified and kind of bundled in this bundle too. Uh, so that includes a number of uh, TDM measures, um, improvements to the sidewalk network, the bike network, uh, expanding transit beyond what the MTP had called for. Uh, and significant increase or a continued increase in uh, the telecommute um, share of, of commute trips. Um, Charlie alluded to also, we had a TDM focus group that met uh, earlier this year and um, through their process, they identified a certain package of, of investments. Um, the, the graphic at the bottom shows a, just a snapshot of the strategic model that RSG had developed, uh, looked at 431 different scenarios and, and where we landed was on uh, a scenario that, that uh, kind of optimized or, or looked at, the, at, at what bent that curve of vehicle miles traveled. So, so looking at what, what combination of investments could best uh, reduce the number of miles that, that uh, we're driving in Chittenden County. And so that package that they identified, what we were able to estimate is that that could reduce the total uh, vehicle miles traveled by up to 20%, uh, which on a 
a slide, I'll show that that's a, that's a very significant reduction in BMT if, if all of those um, uh, measures are, are enacted. So then just moving on, the other, the other three bundles are kind of building again on that bundle two. So, so bundle three is uh, bundle two. So that's all of the TDM measures plus um, a reconstruction of exit 14. And, and what's shown here on the right is uh, the, a, a concept sketch for a diverging diamond interchange at exit 14. Uh, this came out of the interchange evaluation where we looked at several different interchange uh, configurations. And um, after going through the public, uh, going through the technical evaluation and the public uh, discussion, we, um, the preference we landed on this this configuration, the diverging diamond interchange, um, for for this uh, interchange at, at exit 14. Uh, so then bundle four is that bundle three. So that's that's all of the TDM measures plus exit 14, the diverging diamond interchange, and then on top of that. Uh, a new interchange at uh, at um, the Route 116 uh, overpass of, of uh, I-89, so also known as Exit 12B in South Burlington. So that's just south of Tilly Drive. You can see a, a concept sketch here on the right. Uh, and then and then similar similar to Bundle Four, Bundle Five is essentially um, Bundle Three. So it's all of the TDM measures. It's the Exit 14 diverging diamond interchange. And then instead of adding 12B to this bundle, this one adds uh, uh, improvements at the existing exit 13. Um, for those of you who uh, uh, are, are familiar with exit 13, you know you can't quite get in every direction from the interchange today. So if you're coming up from the south, for example, you can't necessarily you can't get to Dorset Street uh, to head to the mall, as an example. Or if you're coming from the south, you also can't get over to Dorset Street. And so um, this, this uh, configuration, there was a, a similar to the exit 12B, there were uh, a number of configurations looked at here at exit 13. Through that uh, interchange evaluation, we landed on this uh, single point diamond interchange, an SBDI uh, configuration. So that, um, that configuration allows all of the movements to happen uh, at this exit 13 so that uh, regardless of which direction you're coming to this exit, you can go you know, west on, on um, 189 or east uh, over to Dorset Street and make you know make your turns onto Dorset Street or continue on to Kennedy Drive. So those are those are um, the bundles kind of in a at a at a high level. Um, so what we did then was to kind of run those through um, some analysis, and um, you can see here there's lots of numbers here on the screen. Um, we won't go through all of the details, but wanted to just hit on some of the kind of um, things that rose to the top that that we saw as we did some evaluation of these different bundles. Um, the columns here on, in the table are the different bundles, and then the rows are different metrics that we were looking at um, for each of those bundles. Um, so to start off, what we saw, one thing that's interesting, it's not shown on this table here, but what we saw is that uh, if we don't do anything to, to uh, improve uh, bicycle pedestrian service, you know, build sidewalks, build bike paths, uh, add transit, encourage uh, telecommuting, if we don't do any of that, the, the uh, current estimate is, is that the amount of miles traveled per day is estimated to increase 28% uh, uh, here as shown uh, out to 2050. So from about 4.2 million miles uh, up to 5.4 million. So that just to kind of get a, get a sense of, of um, scale here. So that's, that's if we do nothing, BMT increases and we see lots of things getting overly congested. We see the interstate, the interchanges all, um, uh, getting congested, if you imagine just today's traffic increasing 28%. And so that's our base, that's our starting point. And so from there, what we see, uh, the improvements that are in the CC, the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission's long range transportation plan. So those improvements uh, reduce our, our VMT a little bit. So that, that drops us down by about 4% with those um, measures in the MTP. Uh, and then further, if we do all of the things that are identified in bundle two, so all of the transportation demand management measure, measures, that gets a, a significant reduction in BMT. So another 20% reduction, which essentially gets us down to today's BMT level. And so if you can imagine that that essentially erases 30 years of growth of travel, if, if we can get all of those bundles implemented. Um, we'll show in a, a future slide. It's a it's a it's a tall order um, to get all of these reductions, and um, uh, you know we really have to make a really drastic shift to um, non motorized um, measures. But that uh, is an important recommendation from the study, and that is one of the first things that we'll be looking to um, to drive uh, to drive forward towards implementation. 
Um, and then just the last two things here, just to note the two uh, bundle four and five. So those look at uh, exit 12B and exit 13 as kind of comparing the two. Um, what we see is, is um, whether you build 12B or 13, both of them serve to reduce the traffic that's going through exit 14. And that's important. We see, you know, exit 14, that's the main gateway into both South Burlington and Burlington. Um, we've got a lot of traffic that's flowing through there. And so any, any uh, measures that we can do to reduce the amount of traffic volume through exit 14 is a positive. And um, so we see here that the uh, exit 13 uh, improvements do reduce the overall traffic through exit 14 a little bit more than, than exit uh, the 12B, but both of them reduce close to you know, 20 to 25% uh, in, both, in both instances. And then similarly, both of those interchanges, if we were to construct one or the other interchange, we also see um, some significant reductions in traffic volumes on both Wilson Road and Dorset Street. Uh, both of those are nearing capacity today. And, um, and so any reduction in, uh, in traffic volumes on those, uh, those roadway roadways will uh, kind of help overall operations and safety and reduce the need to do any capacity expansions on those roadways as well. Okay, so that's um, that's kind of in a nutshell. Those are the five bundles that we uh, that we developed. We ran through full uh, evaluation of those. We've run those through both our advisory and technical committees. And um, before I get to implementation plan, I see Charlie's got uh, maybe a, a comment. Uh, no, a, a question that's in the Q and A, uh, asking how common diverging diamond interchanges are, and how do they work for, or how well do they work for biking, walking, et cetera. Um, Mm -hmm. And the same question for the single point uh, interchange. So that's from Dale at yeah. CLF. Yep. Uh, so the, the diverging diamond interchange um, is becoming a uh, fairly common interchange um, uh, configuration. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, there is one um, uh, getting ready to go to construction at, at exit 16 in Colchester. So the route two and seven interchange uh, will be a diverging diamond interchange. Um, and from a, from a pedestrian and bicycle bicycle standpoint, uh, that was really the driver for choosing this option. As, as I mentioned, we looked at a couple of different configurations for exit 14. And, the, and um, without getting into specifics on kind of how the DDI works, the, one of the primary benefits of a DDI is that when you cross uh, across the street, you're only ever crossing one direction of traffic at one time. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about looking in both directions. You've got kind of small, shorter distances to cross over. And so one of the one of the real issues that we heard today at Exit 14 is just it's not it's not very conducive to walking or cycling across. And so that was really an important consideration um, when we were looking at different alternatives. And, and the group felt that the DDI best accommodated those bicycle and pedestrian trips at, at Exit 14. Um, the, the second half of the question, the single point diamond interchange, those are a little bit less common. Uh, there is one that I think the nearest example is in Concord, New Hampshire, right at um, uh, I think it's at Route 3 in Concord. So that's an example of a, a single point diamond interchange. Uh, those are a little bit less common, but um, unlike a DDI where you're actually crossing over onto the other side of the traffic, which will take a little bit of getting used to, this single point diamond interchange, I think from a, a driver's perspective, you're basically just getting off and coming to a traffic light and then making your movements. So while the configure, you know, from, from the aerial view, it might look a little bit different. I think from a driver's perspective, this will just look like a standard intersection where they get off and see a traffic light and you know, make their movements from there. Dave, there's one more, uh, I guess, more of a comment in the Q&A about uh, having a park and ride at each interchange has been identified as facilitating carpooling, use of buses and mixed mode travel. I don't see planning for a park and ride at each interchange. Um, Wait a few slides, and and uh, we will we will talk about it. So that is one of the recommendations for sure in in uh, the plan. Thanks. Okay, so we've gone through the bundles, and then um, kind of the next step is then how do we move the project or the the elements from each of the bundles forward towards implementation? Uh, and so that um, is uh, the implementation plan is kind of what describes that process to move projects forward. Um, and un unlike um, many standard, for those of you who've, who've been involved in other transportation planning efforts, things like this typically end with uh, a preferred alternative. Here's what we're gonna build and here's how we're gonna implement that one specific recommendation. Uh, in this case, it's, we're looking at 30 years. It's a very complex corridor. There's lots of unknowns. And so we've taken this, uh, uh, taken the opportunity to utilize the implementation plan here to really help 
um, articulate the timing and which projects move forward at what time, given all of the unknowns that we're, that we're uh, facing today. And so um, as noted here, this implementation plan provides that framework um, for each of the recommendations, and we'll go through those in a few slides. Um, the, the plan identifies the things noted here. So a description of the project, the time frame, um, what metrics or triggers would be needed to be met before uh, implementing that project, uh, how much the project would cost, who's in charge, or who would be leading or partnering on the implementation, and then where, what are the next steps. And so just on the side here, this is an example, one of the uh, recommendations. Um, anyone who's been off, uh, you know, in the exit uh, 14 area, this is we're looking at, uh, we've got the CVS in the background, this is getting off northbound 89, you know, we've got two traffic signals fairly close, you've got the signal as you get off the ramp, and then you've got the Williston and Dorset Street, the signals are very close, and that often causes some confusion and, you know, uh, queuing backing up through the signals. So this is one of those recommendations, just as an example. So uh, relocating that signal away from Dorset Street, you can see here the trigger, uh, the cost estimate, and who would be in charge of, of implementing that. So that's kind of how the, the, this, um, the plan works. Um, and then also, as we mentioned before, this implementation plan, because of the unknowns, not, not just COVID, but you know, um, autonomous vehicles and other technologies and other kind of unknowns as we look out 30 years, really felt it was important to have a committee to uh, help to evaluate trends as, as we go forward each year. Oops. Uh, so we'll walk through, so we've got, um, we, we kind of uh, um, uh, bucketed each of the um, recommendations into three, uh, three timeframes. So we have a short and a medium and a long. So short is uh, over the next one to five years. Uh, first thing right out of the gates is to convene that corridor monitoring committee. So we will want them to meet on a regular basis to review the data and the triggers. Um, secondly, uh, as we've noted several times in the previous slides, these transportation demand management measures, the TDM measures, um, we've identified what they are. And so these, these sub bullets here, so um, increasing the amount of teleworking by 50%, doubling trips made by, by bicycle, tripling transit service and improving frequencies, uh, doubling participation in TDM programs, uh, looking at cost of parking, increasing that, and then mileage based user fee. Those, those are some fairly significant measures. Um, and so those have been identified and those are the, those are the components that can get us that 20% reduction in VMT, um, which is a significant reduction, but they're also significant measures that um, you know, we'll really have to uh, take, take a lot of effort to identify how to get, get these um, enacted. And so while we've identified these bullets, this recommendation that's the second bullet here is to develop the plan. How do we advance each of these individual measures? Um, so that's the second bullet. Um, the third bullet is to take the exit 14 evaluation to the next step. Uh, we showed the DDI on the previous slide. That was a very kind of high level conceptual sketch, but moving that forward, uh, um, all are in agreement that that's an important improvement for the, uh, the interstate corridor. So moving that into kind of the next phase of, of uh, scoping public outreach and design. Um, and then the next two are, are kind of monitoring things. So monitoring both uh, the electric vehicle market penetration as we start to see the ramp up of EV vehicles and charging stations. Um, and then looking at as, as the state of Vermont, as other states are looking at uh, implementing a mileage based user fee. So right now, uh, you know, gas, gas vehicles are paying their gas taxes when they fill up their, their gas tanks, but uh, electric vehicles not necessarily. And so there's uh, discussions of a mileage based user fee for those electric vehicles. So implementing that. And then this last one is a small one, just putting on some traffic count loops on the interchange ramp so we can have a better, we can better monitor traffic volumes in real time on, uh, on the interchange. So Dave, we got a couple of questions in the Q and A, um, but one is uh, quick um, about the TDM measures here. What, what was the baseline for the TDM uh, measures? Like when you say increase telework by 50%, 50% compared to what, or doubling bike or tripling transit? Mm -hmm. uh, those are all based, well, the, the, the bicycle and transit are based on today's mode share. So based on today, who's right, you know, how many trips are being made by bicycle, how many are being made by transit. So those are, those are increases over today. The teleworking is a little bit more nuanced and um, it's, you know, it's essentially the telework share. Um, obviously with the COVID pandemic, we saw lots of people working from home. The teleworking went, um, was, was uh, very high, a high percentage of the commute trips. As the pandemic has started to ebb and we've seen people go back to work, that number has gone down. 
And so the 50% is really an increase over and above what, um, what the high water mark was at, at the height of the pandemic. Um, so it is a fairly significant um, share of telework uh, trips, um, which you know, I think underscores the importance of really uh, making sure we've got lots of partners and, and um, the right people around the table to talk about how to implement these, because we'll need to have employers involved, we'll need to have um, multiple parties involved to help make sure that this happens. And did you want to address the park and ride uh, question at this time, or? Uh, that's on the next slide. Oh, okay, sorry. Yep, yep. Thanks. Good, good segue though. Um, so then, so if we move the implementation plan, the first, the last slide was this, the one to five years. This is um, medium term, so six to 15 years. Um, first one uh, are the variable or changeable message boards. So those are the signs uh, out that you'll see on the interstate. Sometimes they have fun messages or sometimes they, they warn you about weather events. Um, the goal for VTrans is to have those in both directions between each interchange um, within the Chittenden County uh, limits. And so that's um, that there's actually those, I think we'll start to see those coming, you know, as soon as maybe even this summer or next summer, there has there have been um, uh, uh, a number of them that are on their way to Chittenden County. So we'll start to see more of those. And so those things, those can activate if there's a, an accident or an incident to help direct people around traffic. So that's a, that's a really important um, measure as well as, you know, weather and other incident um, uh, management. Um, so the next bullet is uh, actually implementing that TDM plan. So the previous slide showed uh, coming up with, you know, how do we, uh, who are the partners, how, what are the steps needed to get, uh, you know, a tripling of transit or a doubling of, of bike trips. This, this bullet is really um, investing on, in those improvements. So that's, you know, uh, adding new, new buses to the network, building new bike paths, those types of things. So that's, that's this uh, implementation bullet here. Um, the third one is around uh, uh, interchange uh, uh, ramp geometrics. So uh, first off at exit 14, what we see um, this, the first sub bullets are reducing the radius, the radii at the ramps. Um, and so right now the, the exit 14 is a cloverleaf interchange. And so it's, it's really built for speed and built for uh, automobiles. And so as you, as you make your, you enter and exit each of the ramps, they're very kind of high speed movements. Uh, so you're not really slowing down as you're going through the interchange today, uh, which is great for, for automobiles, but not so great for pedestrians and cyclists who are trying to cross those ramp uh, entrances and exits. And so that first recommendation, um, and, and all of this is kind of pending the results of the bullet that was on the previous slide to look at exit 14 to confirm what is the right uh, future solution. So once we have that study complete, then looking at uh, potentially reducing those radiuses at each of those enter and exit points to slow down, to force the, the, the vehicles to slow down as they're entering those ramps so that if there are pedestrians or cyclists crossing at the existing crosswalks, they're moving more slowly. Um, so that's that first bullet. The second kind of sub bullet um, was, is to relocate the exit 14 northbound ramp that was shown on the, on the, in the uh, photo on the previous slide. What's shown here on the right is a, a, um, kind of a, a concept sketch showing again that, that shifting of the northbound off ramp west a bit away from Dorset Street to provide a little bit extra space there for the queuing and um, uh, vehicle movements. Um, and then we get to the second to last bullet here. This is uh, constructing additional park and rides and um, transit intercept facilities. Uh, the CCRPC is um, uh, leading a study looking at uh, park and rides throughout the region right now. And so implementing the uh, recommendations that come out of that plan uh, falls here in the medium term. Uh, and then this last one here, this is gets at the question. So if, if you recall a few slides ago, we had our bundles four and five had, uh, bundle four had exit 12B, bundle five had exit 13. Um, and uh, this last bullet really gets at which of those two um, are the better solution to address the issues at the time. And um, it's really important to note here the in italics, if the triggers are met. And so this gets back to the whole idea of monitoring this corridor. Um, this, uh, this next phase of work to look at these two interchanges would not get triggered unless certain, um, certain conditions are met on the interchange. And so those conditions, as we've identified here, are shown here in the blue box to the right. And so um, before initiating kind of that next phase looking at 12B and 13, which here um, environmental impact statement is kind of that the, the vehicle to take that to the next level. Um, before doing that, what we've, what we've um, stipulated here is that the monitoring committee, as they meet periodically, they'll be looking at, first off, is the TDM evaluation complete? Uh, is the exit 14 scoping study complete? 
Um, is the uh, number three is the Wilson Road and Dorset Street intersection over capacity for over two hours? There's some um, uh, uh, that's kind of a critical component. And so even though we're talking about exit 12B and 13, which are a bit removed from the Wilson Road and Dorset Street intersection, what we see is that that's kind of a, a, a nexus of a lot of things in the region. So we've got obviously lots of planned um, uh, growth in, in uh, South Burlington. We've got the University Mall, City Center, We've got a planned city street coming into Dorset Street. And the intersection itself is, is just about uh, built out as much as it can from a capacity standpoint. So it can't really handle too much more traffic. And so what the idea here is that is that um, in it, uh, exit 12B and 13 make um, can can uh, can enhance other things as well, but but I think I think what we felt that the um, that the tie to conditions at Wilson Road and Dorset Street, which is close to capacity today, um, the benefits that both 12B and 13 have to take traffic out of this intersection is really the main driver for looking at 12B and 13, so that we're not looking at finding ways to expand the Wilson Dorset Street intersection even uh, bigger than it is today. And Dave, I'm sorry, um, two things I want to, um, if you could back up, just a park and ride thing. Um, we kind of note that the regional park and ride uh, study plan is underway, but I just also want to note for the record that uh, exit 12 park and ride, I think I just saw them starting to do some clearing at ex south of exit 12. So yeah. that project is just getting underway. Uh, park and ride just got built a couple of years ago at exit 16. Uh, there's also been a study to look at putting one exit 17. Um, and I anticipate, you know, our regional park and ride study that's underway is probably going to have us looking at, you know, what is there a possibility of something at exit 14 or uh, also on like Shelburne Road before you get to 189 um, and uh, amongst others. I don't mean that to be comprehensive, but I just want to um, give a little bit more color. There's more going on than just a study mm -hmm. uh, uh, for uh, Ian who asked about uh, the park and ride efforts. Um, and then we got uh, a question about is 12B a done deal? Um, and I'm just going to, I'm responding in writing also in the Q&A. Um, but the, the short answer to that is no, <laughs> period. Um, but what we're indicating to you tonight is we'll keep monitoring conditions in the corridor. And that's, and this is what Dave was just reviewing. Um, and uh, depending on how things look, and we review it with that quarter monitoring committee, uh, we may initiate with VTrans, uh, and this is really, well, VTrans will be the lead at this point, an environmental impact statement to evaluate if 12B or 13 makes sense or do nothing, which is always an option when you do an EIS. Um, so it, it is not a done deal in either direction. It's neither not going to happen or definitely going to happen. We don't know is really the, the correct answer, uh, but this is kind of a commitment to monitoring the situation um, and at the appropriate time, if it looks uh, like it's the appropriate time based on at least these uh, initial measures or triggers that Dave just reviewed, then we might start that EIS process uh, to look at uh, whether we should do one or, or another of those interchanges or nothing. Okay. Oh, was, was that fairly accurate, Dave? <laughs> yeah, no, that's spot on. Yep, yep. Okay, um, we're just about we're just about at the finish line here. So to, the last piece here are the long term actions. Um, so we have two here in the fifteen plus years. Oh, Dave, before you get going on this, I got one yep. more little little technical question. Dale's asking about the um, what is VC ratio of 0. 0.9? Like, what does that really mean for a driver? What does that feel like? Um, yep. Yeah, um, that's a very good question and um, something I just glossed over. Um, it essentially means that uh, it's it's volume to capacity. So V over C is the volume to capacity. So it's basically the ratio. What I like to do is think of it as a pipe. So if the road was a pipe, that means it's 90% full. So the 0.9, you know, once, and as we get close to one, that pipe is completely full. And then you start to see really long backups. And, you know, typically as a traffic engineer, we tend to look at that 0.9 or 90% full as kind of that break point at, at which point things start to kind of fall apart or you know we start to see um, excess delays and so forth and so that's kind of a common threshold um, and uh, so that's that's the what we would be monitoring so when does this intersection get to be 90 percent full essentially 
Uh, okay, so um, just to uh, wrap up here, um, long term, uh, uh, the midterm, we had a couple of kind of quick hitting interchange ramp improvements. Uh, there's two specific ra ramps that uh, we're calling out that uh, for long term actions because they involve bridge widening. Uh, one example here, one of the two uh, is at exit 11 in Richmond. Um, if you can see on the right here, the white line, so existing acceleration length. So if you're coming, you know, if you're coming out of Richmond and you're heading towards Burlington, you've got uh, 630 feet to accelerate. Um, based on uh, current guidance today, you should have about 1,200 feet to accelerate. Um, and uh, I, I believe when the interstate was originally constructed, they this was a little bit short because there's that second bridge that what's what's highlighted in the light blue here over the railroad and uh, and the Berber Lane, uh, and so. This is just an example where ideally we would have 1,200 feet, an opportunity to accelerate fully up to 65 miles an hour. Uh, we don't have that today, so that's that's a specific example. It would require uh, you know a, a new bridge, um, so that's a fairly ex expensive. I think we're in the 10 to 15 million dollar uh, improvements here to to improve that. So thus it it lands in the long term actions. Um, and then lastly, um, what we've kind of held out here is uh, looking at potentially widening the interstate. Um, and so this is in the event that there is a need for a third lane on any particular segment. Um, and again, uh, the caveat here is if these triggers are met. And um, so on the right here, we're showing what those triggers are. Uh, so the first trigger is uh, the volume. So a segment, the average annual daily traffic volume, so AADT. Uh, so if we see that trending uh, above 70,000 cars per day uh, over the next 15 years, that would be one trigger. Uh, just as a, as a, as a uh, basis of comparison, we're at about 50, 50 to 52,000 today on um, kind of between exit 14 and 15. So over the bridge, over the Minooski River, we're, we're in the 50,000-ish range. So still some room left before we get to that uh, uh, kind of overcapacity situation. Um, similar to the, the, the Wilson and Dorset Street intersection, we're also looking at uh, kind of thinking of this as a pipe. And so if this pipe gets to be over 90% uh, full for more than two hours over the next 15 years, that would be another trigger. Uh, then if we see certain crash, if, if crashes exceed a certain rate, this critical crash rate, that would be a, a third trigger. And then the final trigger is uh, travel time reliability. And so this is really a metric of, you know, if, if you drive 89 as part of your daily commute and you know it takes you 20 minutes to get to work each day, uh, the reliability is that you know that on general, it's gonna take you, you know, maybe 25 minutes one day to 18 minutes the next day, that's your rel reliability. Um, if things start to get over capacity and you start to see, um, you know, congestion on certain days, then your trip, your trip may become 30 minutes some days or 35 minutes some days, and then 18 minutes the next day. And that's when it, that's the reliability piece. And when that starts to kind of fluctuate, um, drivers tend to get frustrated. And so uh, this is something that VTrans man monitors every year. Um, we're well above that kind of the 90% threshold. Um, but if that were ever to drop below 90%, that would be the, the fourth trigger for the new, new lane. So um, then just to kind of bring it all home here for the kind of monitoring process. Um, so uh, as we've mentioned this a couple of times, we, uh, given the unknowns, we've got this uh, kind of uh, piece in here to monitor and reassess uh, the, the, um, the data and that will be led by this monitoring committee. Uh, and they'll be looking at a number of different things. So how, how well has the TDM measures been implemented? Uh, what are traffic volumes looking like? Is that curve starting to bend because we are starting to see more people shift onto, onto buses or bikes or, or walking? Um, how are crashes looking? What are those reliability metrics? And then um, mode shifts. So, so how many people, what percentage of uh, trips are being made in cars versus bus versus bike versus uh, on foot? And so at those regular meetings, they'll have the data to review, and then they'll be evaluating those against the, the identified triggers to see if there's, uh, if any of the triggers are met. And if they are, this monitoring committee would then advise uh, VTrans to consider moving forward with one of those recommendations. So I think with that, um, I will pass it back to Charlie. Yeah, so um, sorry, Dave, I've had one question that's been hanging here for a while about um, commercial traffic and whether we study that particularly tractor trailers and which options would be best to reduce traffic through residential areas. Uh, we did not look at that specifically. And, um, and the focus of the study and the evaluation was really on the interstate corridor and um, to the extent that some of the the new interchange, well, the new interchange at 12B or the uh, the 
uh, enhanced configuration of 13. I would say those both do draw some traffic, both both commercial vehicles and you know automobiles off of some of the side streets because they can access the interstate uh, more easily. So I would say you know one of those, but we didn't we didn't um, look specifically at commercial vehicles or really on neighborhood streets what the impacts would be. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, another question, um, which I, I'm not sure you know the answer uh, to this one, uh, but uh, with, will the Exit 11 park and ride ever be equipped with fast DC chargers to encourage electric vehicle use? And I would be surprised if it's not. I think I think Vtrans's goal is to have uh, an EV charging station at every interchange, and so that would seem like a logical spot at Exit 11. Yeah, and I was just to uh, supplement what Dave just said. I think the legislature has tasked Vtrans with really looking at where uh, charging stations are located, um, and I agree with Dave. I, I would be surprised if that wasn't one of the locations to get EV charging uh, stations uh, set up there. Yeah, um, and then. Uh, Karen Yakos is asking, can we in Vermont decide to adjust the triggers to represent something other than ease of driving? Um, how would that be done? Um, and that's a good, um, yeah, I'm sorry that's not kind of coming across as Dave looked at you know, individual triggers for uh, different pieces, Karen. But um, I think a big part of the monitoring program is really monitoring the TDM efforts. Um, and so, um, yes, we can definitely adjust the triggers. I think, you know, the corridor monitoring committee um, and VTRANS and CCRPC as they meet over time, we'll probably have that discussion, you know, like, oh, you know, something else is going on. We should monitor X that we're not monitoring. So we can certainly adjust the triggers um, or even, you know, change the threshold, right? Maybe it's not 0.9, maybe it's 0.95 or, right? Um, so I think we're trying to, um, communicate a system that uh, is flexible and can adapt to what is an unknown future. Um, you know, I kind of early on talked about, you know, whether it's a pandemic or technology, uh, autonomous cars, climate change, there's a lot of unknowns uh, in our future. So I think we're intending for this implementation plan to uh, be a living uh, effort, if you will, not not a document, but an actual living effort that does um, adapt as we learn more things over time. Um, and again, I think you know the big focus early on is going to be on that uh, TDM work and how uh, fast and far those things can be implemented um, to reduce the need for you know any of those uh, capacity improvements. And that you know that is that is the big issue in front of us, uh, not just related to the study, frankly, but you related to just the transportation system, climate change, uh, or the transportation contributions to climate change uh, in front of us. So there's there's a lot more there. I hope that is a helpful answer. I don't know, Dave, did anything you wanted to add to that? No, I thought that that was good. Um, so okay, um, well, you guys were not not too hard on us with too many questions coming too fast. Um, I believe I got to every question and answered it either verbally um, in the session, or there were a couple that I was able to take uh, answer uh, in writing in the Q and A. Um, let me know if there's anything missing there. Uh, I see Dale has her hand up. Dale. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I just um, I wanted to offer a comment. Um, because this is the first that I've seen of the uh, specific triggers for um, starting that EIS for uh, adding lanes to the highway. <laughs> and yeah. I just wanted to offer a comment that, you know, I think in some ways, if we have that level of traffic, it actually offers opportunities because it means that there would be demand for a really robust public transportation system. And so I actually think that in some ways, like those, those traffic thresholds could be seen as indicating that the TDM triggers or the TDM goals aren't high enough so that maybe tripling transit as a mode share 
You know, if we've got that many people driving on the interstate, we ought to have plenty of people who would like to be using some better form of transportation than their own car. Just wanted to offer that as a comment. Yeah, uh, and Dale, it's a, it's a good point. And I think um, if I could just uh, put a twist on what you just said, well, I have two thoughts. One is um, if there is that much of an increase in driving on the interstate, that means that the TDM efforts have not been fully implemented and or embraced by the public. Um, and so I think that is that is the big fork in the road. So if I can use that analogy, <laughs> you know, uh, does, is TDM embraced and used? And, you know, to your point, if there's that many more people that could potentially get to that many more drivers, you know, are they able to use a bus instead? And um, and if if they're not using the bus, how how is there are there ways to induce that change in behavior? Um, so that is a question. I and and the the bigger point I wanted to make. The second point is we really had some good internal debate about whether to even include that widening thing in here as part of the implementation. Like, is it really a recommendation or not? Um, because I think at this, based on what we know today, you know, we're of the belief that it's not likely that we ever get to that point, particularly, especially if we're successful in implementing those TDM strategies. And so um, it's there, but it's, you know, way down, again, way down the road, sorry to use that analogy, way down the tracks, maybe I'll say. Um, and so, um, I, I don't want anybody to walk away out of this meeting saying, oh, they're planning to widen the interstate. That is not at all the message you should be taking away from what we're uh, saying. It's that, you know, if everything else goes wrong and, you know, I guess there was one scenario when we were doing our long range transportation plan that uh, is stuck in my head, which was, what is the future of autonomous vehicles? Um, you know, and there's one, that's like a shared autonomous vehicle future, you know, like, oh, there's there's a car coming by and I can hop in, you know, kind of like almost transit on demand or carpooling on demand um, type of thing through apps, right? You know, Uber ride share, you know, Lyft ride share type things. Um, that's not so bad, but there is a bad scenario with autonomous vehicles, which is that it takes people to their destinations and then empty cars go back on the highway network to, you know, go to a parking lot or go back to your house or, you know, so there are, I think there are potential futures out there that actually have a lot more different kinds of vehicles driving on the roads and there are. Basically move forward with implementation starting um, next year and the years to come. The final report will be done in the summer of 2022 sometime uh hopefully by july uh we should be finishing everything up and everything is going to be on the website and i think that's the last slide dave yep that's right yeah so um i can see if anybody has a question or a raise hand does anybody we do not have any more uh open questions or hand raises okay well, wonderful. Thank you all so very much for participating and providing again comments and asking questions and uh, just be in touch if you have any other thoughts. Yeah, thank you for picking that up, Eleni. And uh, sure. yeah, and, and if you have um, a group uh, or anybody that you know, you'd like us to follow up with and get into a little bit more detail, happy to do a deeper dive with anybody. Um, let us know. Yeah, thank you all very much. And um, wow, I, I didn't anticipate being done by seven o'clock. Uh -huh. So is anybody having a good barbecue? <laughs> I, have a, I have an hour free tonight. So yeah, that's a joke. I'm good. Uh, Enjoy the evening. Yeah, thank you all very much. Have a good night. <laughs>